In the scriptures, we find many terms, many names, many symbols, wherein the Lord seeks, apparently, to convey to us his special love, mercy, favor, and kindness toward the Israel people, the Isaac son his servant kingdom people. For instance, in the book of Exodus, again and again, God speaks of these people as my people, in contrast with all other people. Then he speaks of them also in Exodus as God's peculiar treasure. This is found in the song. These are beautiful terms, very significant, very meaningful. In fact, he calls them my people throughout the entire Bible. Then he speaks of them as a special people. Now, I'm aware of what this sounds like in view of the communistic, socialistic, atheistic, anti-Bible propaganda of today, where there is practically no regard for the plain teachings of the Scripture. So I am aware of this, and I understand this. But I'm going to give you some of the names, some of the terms that the Almighty himself uses in referring to the Isaac son, the Anglo-Saxons, the people of Christendom, and those that uh, disapprove, well, they can take it up with the Almighty. I'm just the messenger. I'm just bringing the word. We find also that the Lord speaks of these people as holy. Now, that's, that's rather difficult to understand. And if you have difficulty in understanding God's love, God's mercy, God's special favor and kindness, as stated in the scripture toward the Israel people, perhaps it'll help you if you try to account for his kindness, his mercy, and his favor toward you. How worthy are you? And how much better are you? Or are we than these other people of Anglo-Saxondom? So he calls them my people, my peculiar treasure, a special people unto myself. He says, a holy people, holy nation. Now that doesn't mean sinless. Simply means set aside, chosen of God to render a service. That's all it means. He speaks of them as being sanctified. Now, some people have difficulty in believing in their own sanctification, and here God says he sanctified Israel. Well, this is the book. This is the Word of God. And you who are familiar with the Scripture, you recognize immediately that that's what I'm giving you. They're spoken, these people, the Isaac sons, the Anglo-Saxons of today, are spoken of in the Scripture, the Old Scriptures, identified very clearly as the Israel people. They're spoken of as saints. Saints. Now, you don't hardly imagine yourself a saint, do you? Well, God speaks for these people as saints. Then again and again in Isaiah, especially, he calls them chosen. Chosen. That's stated repeatedly. And these are the words of the Almighty himself. Then he speaks of them as my beloved. He calls them the elect. That's right. You find it in Isaiah? Mine elect. And he says, they're precious. Says they're precious. 
so precious that he said, I gave nations for thee. Then repeatedly they're spoken of as the redeemed of the law. My redeemed and the redeemed of the law is found throughout Isaiah especially. He calls them my servant. God calls these people my firstborn. And he calls them my son. And he speaks of them as his bride and his wife. That's food for thought, isn't it? That's food for thought. Now, what is this? This, my friend, is the gospel of the kingdom. Now, God's love and mercy and kindness and favor to these people was not just for their sake. It was for the sake of the whole world. In fact, the matter is, the whole creation is to be delivered, restored, reconciled through God's mercy, redemption toward Israel. Now let's turn to the new scriptures. Let's turn to the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Let's begin reading from verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, the outer tabernacle, or the first, accomplishing the service of God, the ritual and the ordinance of the church, the body of Christ. But, now think with me, and you'll have comfort. You'll have a basis for the deliverance of America. But, into the second, went the high priest alone, once every year, not with our blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. For the errors of the people. Atonement for the Isaac sons. We read the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tab tabernacle was yet standing, and we read, which was a figure of the time then present. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves. Now, that's what Aaron had to have, but not Christ. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. Now, I know you're going to have to exercise a little faith to accept this, but I ask you, how could there be a kingdom of God on earth if this hadn't been accomplished? Eternal salvation for everybody. Christ died for the world, as we read in the New Scriptures. This was redemption for Israel, just as plain as can be. All right, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Now, if you're a member of the body of Christ, you have more than purification of the flesh. You have purification of the spirit. Purification of the spirit. You have to be born again. This is the gospel of the kingdom. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve? Serve. There you have it. Everything that I've said and everything I've called your attention to, God's purpose has been and is 
that these people might serve him and in turn bless all the nations of the earth. And that's what he promised Abraham. Sir, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Now you know, according to Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, you know that the New Testament, the New Covenant, was made with the Isaac sons. And it replaced the old covenant made at Mount Sinai. It didn't replace the covenant of personal salvation. The covenant of personal salvation has never been replaced. It never waxed old. It's always been by blood in the Messiah. Some look forward, we look backward. He isn't talking here about the covenant of personal salvation. He's talking about the one covenant that God made with the Israel people at Mount Sinai, the covenant that they broke. Then he makes a new covenant. And in the new covenant, he takes all the responsibility and he says, I will, you shall. In the old covenant, he says, if you will, I will. In the new covenant, he says, I will and you shall. It's a little different. Let's turn to Psalm 130. Look at verse 7 and 8 of Psalm 130. Let Israel, that's a body of people, and a tremendous body of people, not the name of a denomination, no, and it's not the name of the church, no, it's the name of the Isaac sons, the Anglo-Saxons, let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquity. Plenteous redemption. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquity. Let's turn to Isaiah 43, verse 25. Of course, Isaiah is just full of this, so I just have to pick out a few verses here and there. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sin. Put me in remembrance, let us plead together, declare thou that thou mayest be justified, and we may be justified on the redemption and through the redemption of Christ, because he said, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions, not for your sake, for my own sake. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. Yet, now, hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen, thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Then we have this tremendous prophecy and promise of great spiritual revivals coming to the Anglo-Saxon people. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring, and the only people, as a people, down through history that have had this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit are the same people, the Anglo-Saxons. Books, volumes have been written on the revivals that have swept this people, 
This generation after generation. One time it would break out in Scotland, sometime in Germany, sometimes in France, sometimes in England, sometimes in Scandinavia, and sometimes here in America. Canada. God has done just what he said he would do. And the only revival and the only outpouring of a spirit that other people have had has been an overflow from the revivals among the Isaac sons. Now, why could he do that? How come? Because of our priest, our high priest. He went into the holiest of holy. He went into the presence of God. And on his breastplate, he had the names of the twelve tribes of Israel set in gold. Precious stones set in gold. Well, let's uh, move on to the 21st and 22nd verse of the next chapter. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. And isn't that comforting? <laughs> you know, 99% of the Christian people and 99% of the clergy have forgotten all about this. Not only forgotten it, never knew it. Never knew it. Don't pay any attention to it. Don't believe it when they hear it. Well, I'm glad God says I'm not going to forget. And after all, it doesn't make much difference what men do. It's what God decrees that counts. He says, I'm not going to forget. Then he says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Do you think they're going to return? Amen. Brothers and sisters, they're going to return. Yes, they are. They're going to return. In the 45th chapter, verse 25, In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and glory. Uh, I, I warn you, my friend. I warn you. There's no greater sin than to question the words of the Almighty. No greater sin. Now I remind you, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now if you can't understand and explain and satisfy your own mind on all of this, you just leave that for the time being, but you believe God. You believe God. You know what happens to unbelievers. And don't be an unbeliever. The 49th chapter and verse 13. Sing, O heavens. Be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, that's the United States of America, and this is what we're saying, this is what a lot of preachers are saying. Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me, my Lord hath forgotten me. <laughs> well, I'm glad he isn't going to forget. That's, what, that's the preaching, that's the preaching. The United States is going the way of Babylon and Greece and Rome and, you know, all the emphasis is on the sins of the flesh. And we've fallen for this propaganda. If we'd stop to think, we'd realize there's more gospel being preached today in the United States of America perhaps today than used to be preached ten years ago, or before we had the radio at least, in a week or a month. And people give to the preaching of the gospel where they used to be able to raise a dollar or two, and now they're raising hundreds and thousands of dollars to preach the word all over the world. And yet we fall for this propaganda that we're the most wicked people on earth. Well, God doesn't think so. 
We're in Isaiah 49. Then we read, Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of a womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste. Thy destroyers and they that make thee waste shall go forth of thee. And God speed the day. What's that? The cleansing of the kingdom. That's what it is. And here's a beautiful symbol again. He says, I have graven thee upon my hands, reminding us of the crucifixion of the Christ when he was nailed to the cross, nails piercing his hands, bloodshed for the redemption of his kingdom people. Well, in verse 24 and uh, down through verse 26 of the same chapter we read, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? In other words, God saying, Do you suppose anybody can cancel out what I have decreed concerning the Isaac sons? Do you suppose that some people can take over my people, my kingdom people, that I have redeemed? He says, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. The greatest thing you can do is to believe it. That's right. The greatest thing you can do is to believe it. And if you believe it, it will be a reality. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine, and all flesh. Now see if you can take this in. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One, of Jacob. <laughs> what more could he say? Huh? What more could he say? We should go to Jeremiah also, but let's take still one more in Isaiah. Isaiah fifty four seventeen. Very familiar passage. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Thank God that includes all the weapons that the communists have. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Remember, God speaks of us as his servant. Now note this. And their righteousness is of me. Amen. Amen. That settles it, doesn't it? Our righteousness isn't something we produce. It's something that Christ purchased. Jeremiah, the 50th chapter, two brief verses, and then we're through. Verse 20 of the 50th chapter. In that day and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and shall, and there shall be none, the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter, in the next chapter. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, for the Lord of hosts, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Isn't that something? Let me read it again. For Israel has not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, 
though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Why? Because of Calvary. Because of our high priest. Because he carried us on his breastplate, over his heart. Verse 10. And this is a good time to stop. The Lord hath brought forth our righteousness, and he has, my friend. It's not ours. It's something God has brought forth. He's brought it forth. Listen to this. Come and let us declare in Zion the works of the Lord our God. And aren't we blessed? Aren't we privileged, honored, and favored? This is what we've been called to do. This is what we do. Declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. May God help us. And he will. Thank you so much, Pastor Stadscliffe.